this is a big deal, uh, this, this, um, this series on the family. I'm going to be doing something today, and then we're going to kind of kick back in it in about two weeks, and we're going to go through, uh, we're probably going to have at least five or six messages on the Christian family as it relates to Colossians 3, which uh, where we're at uh, now in our, in, our, uh, in our text as we're walking through that. Today we're going to be looking at Colossians 3.21. But let me just say this. Uh, typically, the church gets in arrears, you might say. They're always behind the game. So things start happening in, in history and in their culture, and then we're kind of caught behind the eight ball, and then we're reacting, and by then it's just too late. And so this series is about, like I said, men, what does it mean to be a man? What is a woman? What is a man, a husband, a wife? What are, what are the parents' jobs and roles? And, and this is just super important. Uh, and it's serious. Uh, you know, we're not doomsdayers here by any means, but what our children are going to be facing in the years, in their growing up years, and in, and in, in even getting to those grown up years, is so much different than what we grew up in, and we can't put our head in the sand here. We have to understand what's at stake and be able to articulate to our children and to a culture uh, why we do the things we do. A lot of times, we'll know doctrinally, we'll be able to explain things doctrinally, but why? And to to, to tell our children the whys and to be able to, to testify to a culture as to why. Why do we believe this? Why are these things so important? Why are they non-negotiable? Today is a Father's Day message. Uh, it is Father's Day. But the word here that we're going to see here in a second for fathers could also be translated parents. So it's a parenting message, essentially. And uh, just because you might not be a parent right now, maybe you will be maybe at some point in the future, so young people pay attention. But also, if you're a grand, uh, maybe you're a grandparent, it's still applicable. We still have influence, and we need to help even your children. You still have influence. You need to help them in understanding why uh, this is so important. And what does God have to say about the thing? And that's the good news is we don't have to be reactionary. We don't have to respond. We don't have to wonder what to do next because we have the word of God. And the word of God never changes. And praise the Lord for that. And the word of God works. It just works. It's proven itself. And so we don't have to be reactionary. We just return to God's word. And we, as people of the book, we follow out the instructions we've been given from God. So turn in your Bibles uh, into, the, into the message, Colossians 3.21. Uh, it's a very just one verse this morning uh, as it relates to fathers, and in particular, you might say parents as well. Let's read and pray. Colossians 3, 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Let's pray. Father, so much meaning and weight in just one verse. It's so critical and important in today's world. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd come and help me to tell the truth without fear of man. But God, that you would convict us in our hearts that these aren't just niceties, just nice ideas. This is your plan for all that we know is good and righteous in this world. You have order. God, help us not just to believe it on paper, but to put it down in our hearts and have conviction that we might live it out. Cause us to change. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, the word father can be translated uh, parents, but the word is fathers as it's translated. And most of the time it is translated fathers and it is Father's Day. And so it's appropriate to, I'm going to pick on the fathers this morning. But again, this is a message about really about parenting and what the Bible has to say about parenting. But the idea of a father, we can't assume anymore either, can we? Uh, at least historically how we've known the idea of a father. 
And so we must say, uh, we must say and define these things more precisely. Uh, when we say father, we mean a man or a husband uh, that is clearly taught in the Bible being responsible, the responsible party in a home, in the nuclear family as we might have come to know it historically. And that is a servant leader. Let me just put that out there. Because we have to understand what it is to uh, be responsible as a, as a husband or as a man for our home. Because the world would call this kind of thinking or idea, of even what I just said, uh, toxic masculinity. And sure, we acknowledge as men uh, and as people in the church that uh, our, our uh, men or taking this leadership role has been abused. But we're not talking about the abuse situations. We're talking about what it's supposed to look like. And so the world will find these examples where men have been uh, bad leaders and abusive and dominant in unbiblical ways. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the good stuff. In fact, it was funny. I, I, I like the, it's hard to find good movies to watch anymore. So I went and thought, I'll go back and watch the 007 movies. I kind of like that stuff. You remember James Bond? Young people, you probably don't know who he is. But I went back and watched the old ones. And I was amazed just how badly women were portrayed in that movie. And here's the thing. It was kind of funny to me, ironic. In the same way that women were portrayed as kind of ditzy and dumb and not don't have things together, that's exactly how men are being portrayed in today's society. Isn't that whole thing flipped around, hasn't it? It's kind of funny, but it's really not. But it's true. And it's wrong. It's just wrong. And so no wonder uh, the, the culture has reacted the way it has. And so we need to take hold of some of that blame that we've had bad leadership. But the Bible teaches a kind of servant leadership. That is a leader who doesn't see himself as better, but as equal. That's super important that we understand that a man or woman, nobody is better than the other in God's eyes and the way God teaches us in the Bible. Equal, but different. And we'll talk about this in these, this sermon series coming up. Equal, but different. Different roles, different responsibilities, but equal. And one of those roles given to the man is the role of leadership. Now, people to try to understand this. Why would God make it this way? Why does it? Uh, we, I used to be a CPA for many, many, many years. And uh, one of the things that would happen is people would come in and they'd say, we want a 50-50 partnership. And I'd say, no, you don't. Because <laughs> I've been here in this room uh, over and over in 50-50 partnerships. And one partner wants to do this and one partner wants to do that. And because they're 50-50, nothing could happen. And the only place to resolve it is in the court system. Somebody needs to be 5149 so that they can make those decisions. And this is the idea. We understand this concept. Somebody is responsible. When things go south in our country, who do they point at? They point the finger at the president, right? Typically. And when things go wrong in an organization, the leadership is responsible. And so it's true in the home, in the family, that a man is held responsible. And we have a leadership crisis and a leadership problem in this culture. And so when we think about what's wrong in America, let it start with its leaders of the home, the men. The context of, 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 of Colossians, the book of Colossians is re, how, how were men or fathers portrayed then or, or how did they, how did they uh, operate in that society, fathers in Roman culture in, in Colossians at this time had absolute control over every aspect of, of, of their family. They could sell their children into slavery. They could even put their children to death if they so choose without any repercussions. And that's really the context. So when it says uh, uh, the warning here about provoking your children to anger, lest they become discouraged, this was a harshness. This was a hardness where kids didn't really matter. They were a, a, a obtrusion into life. And so it was in the context of, of overly harsh fathers. But friends, we don't necessarily have that, much, that problem so much anymore in our culture 
The problem that we have now plaguing us in our culture is the problem of children actually being in control and not the parents, not the father. And largely, parents on a large scale, not everybody, of course, but overall, parents could be defined as afraid, hesitant, uncertain, and then for the most part have just taken their hand off the will in, in many cases about what it means to show, to, to, to show discipline and instruction and how to lead the family and to lead their children. And what we have found is now that children are in control and what we call uh, in, in sometimes in biblical counseling, child-centered homes instead of parent-centered homes. Lou Priola wrote a great book, and in his book he, wrote, he says this, a child-centered home is one in which a child believes and is allowed to behave as though the entire household, parents, siblings, and even pets exist for one purpose, to please him or her. No consequences or inconsistent consequences for bad behavior, manipulation, and the, ch- uh, and the child always wins. They always get what he or she wants. Parents walk on eggshells as to not offend the child. In contrast to a child-centered home where pleasing and serving the child is a dominant theme is the God-centered home. The God-centered home, he says, is one in which everyone is committed to pleasing and serving God. God's desires are exalted over everyone else's. Everyone in the family may be expected to sacrifice personal pleasure if God will re- requires it. This philosophy teaches children to serve rather than be served, to honor rather than to be honored. Values, truth, not concerned with parents or children winning as the end, as the end in itself. Discipline is conducted for the child's good to shape them in a God-honoring direction, not merely in an expression of a parent's anger. What we are experiencing in our, in our culture, friends, will not be corrected by legislation. Don't you love this when something bad happens? It's like, hmm, let's, let's form a committee and pass some legislation. Right? That is not going to be the answer. And even the church has lost its way. But again, friends, I just commend you to the scriptures, the word of God. And I'm praying, and it's my heart, that we would have kind of a, what I call a Josiah movement, if, a moment. You remember uh, the young king Josiah, he found the Bible, <laughs> he found the law, and he's like, what in the world do we have here? And he starts to read it, and all the people came and gave their hearts back to Josiah, and the whole culture was transformed, the whole the whole, uh, the whole family, the whole, the whole culture at that time, that context was to return to the word of God. That's what I'm praying. But friends, in the word, at the helm is the father. And as we watch the, the, the culture spin out of control and the culture wants to play blame games, we see this. They want to blame guns or racism or drugs and form committees to solve the problem or to study the problem. Friends, it's not rocket science. If we look at the simple facts, here's what you find. Fathers are simply out of the picture. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 18.4 million children, that's one in four, live without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. 39% of students in the United States from first grade to senior do not have a father in the home. Four times greater risk of poverty, two times greater risk of infant mortality, more likely to go to prison, more likely to commit crimes, seven times more likely to become pregnant. Teens are two times more likely to suffer obesity, two times more likely to drop out of school, 85% of the youth in prisons, 90% of runaways, 75% of those in chemical abuse centers, come from fatherless homes. And look at this birth, this trend, right? Do we have that picture? Uh, this is a, a trend line from 1940s. It's, it's uh, essentially non-marital birth rates. And over here on the left is 1940, and over here is at least 2010, I think it's 2014. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that things have 
changed dramatically from 1940 to now in our culture, and this is the leading statistic. So this is facts, this is science, this isn't the Bible conjuring up some kind of conspiracy theory. This is a major problem. There was a study done at Harvard University, ironically, some years ago, and that, that study discovered the crucial factors in predicting delinquency in children ages five and six. They studied them, they surveyed them when they were five and six, and they came back four years later and surveyed they again, uh, them again. And with 90% accuracy, they could tell you which of the children were gonna go south as far as being delinquent. And here are the four factors in that to, that they could they use to predict delinquency. Number one, a father's discipline. That is a discipline being fair and consistent. Number two, a mother's supervision, a mother being with her children more than any other person. Number three, a mother and father's affection for each other demonstrated and seen by the, by the, by the children. Number four, a family's cohesiveness, father, mother, children, united, doing life together, not separated. That's from Harvard University. <laughs> so what is the call of parenting? And notice that this is written to Christian parents and Christian fathers, that he's writing to the church. What is the goal of fathering, of parenting? I think for the most, for the average Christian, if we're honest with each other, it's the American dream that we would have kids that don't cuss and are moral and get good grades and have success in sports or the arts or whatever. And then they go to college and get good paying jobs and move into the suburbs and buy a nice house. And then they, they do that again. And then they have children that do good in school and get good grades and, and uh, are good at sports and go to college and get a degree. And, and, and it's just, that's, that's it. That's what it's all about. Have your 2.4 kids and, uh, and move on and just keep, keep going with the flow. But that is not what the Bible teaches us, although that's not necessarily bad, any of those things. The objective for Christian parenting, fathers, is the number one. I didn't put this on the, uh, uh, I'll have some uh, outline here, but this isn't in the outline. Number one, to be, uh, to demonstrate or to be an example. To represent God, that is your job. To try to be a picture of what we know and to demonstrate the character and nature of what we know about God. And the child is going to seek or shape and form his ideas about the world and about life as we demonstrate and teach them about uh, through our actions about and, and representing God. In other words, we don't just teach about love, a biblical view of love and what God says about love, but they experience love. They experience grace. So they, they know what it's like. They've, they've tasted it through their experiences with their father or their mother. We don't just teach about repentance, that is to turn away from sin and, and turn towards God and to trust him, but we demonstrate it in our lives and we try to help them to live it out so they get a taste for what it means actually to, to repent, to turn towards God. This was the role of Christ, not that we're like Christ, we fall short of Christ, but listen to what Christ says about himself to his, to his disciples. In John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Talking to Philip says, I want to see the Father. Show me the Father. And Jesus says, you don't, you've, I've been with you and you know me, Philip. Don't you know me? Whoever has seen the Father, whoever has seen me has seen the Father, he says. So how can you say, show us the Father? But you see what he's saying there? You see me, you've seen the Father. And what we're trying to do as fathers or parents is we're trying to represent Christ so that they know God through our example. Not perfectly, of course, because we're not Christ. The goal then of Christian parenting is to create the parable of the good father in our children's lives. Friends, there are no guarantees that your children will turn out. You don't press A7 
in a vending machine and out pop out great children every time. I wish it was that way. But some of the best parents I know have children that go south. There are no guarantees. We have to trust the Holy Spirit. We have to trust the work of God in their lives. But what we want to do is create for them a picture of God so that when they do come to that point, that they remember the good father, like the, the parable of the prodigal child, the prodigal son. What happened? He, he ran it. He did it his own way. He did it his own way. He, he, he lived it out. You know, he's, um, I did it my way. He sang the song. He lived it out. And then he realized it was a dead end. And what? Where did he return? And why did he return? Because the father was good. He remembered his father being good, and he thought, I'll go home. And that's what we're trying to create. We don't want to have our children run off into the world and say, you know what? I'm not going back home because my father was, he said one thing and did another. Even though we do that, but then we repent of that. What we want our children to do is put them in conflict with God or context of God. That the reason they don't return home is because I don't like what God has to say about that, not because my father was a jerk. So we want to put them in conflict with God. That's our job is to say, here's what God says. We're trying to live it out. We're trying to demonstrate its goodness and value. And they might reject it, but it will be a God problem and not a dad problem. The other thing is, number two would be instruction. So example, we're to demonstrate, that's the objective and goal, but then we're to instruct, that is teaching and training. The objective of Christian parenting is to help them see and know God or know the Father uh, um, by teaching them how to see the world and how to see the life and how to see themselves. And this, friends, has to be a wake-up call for us in this area. We... Parents, friends, are responsible for the teaching and educating of their minds, not the culture, not the school, not the church. We are. It's our job. They spend most of their time uh, in our homes, and it's our job and our responsibility. And fathers, it's your job to make sure this happens, that teaching and training are done so that they have a view of the world uh, that, that's biblical that they see the world, the world's problems, politics, money, sex, all of it through the lens of the word of God. Deuteronomy 6, 6, 9 says this, and these words I command you today, you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently. That means all the time to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets on your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. How are you doing? It's simply just everything that happens in life always coming back to the context of saying, what does God say? How do we see that? What is the world? You're creating a worldview in our kids. We can't. We can't save them, we can't make them, but we can create a lens and a framework for how they see the world, and that is our job, and it's nobody else's job, and it's time we take that more seriously. Let's get into the text. The objective is to point them to Christ, ultimately, not to worldly success. Number one, uh, we see in this uh, an exhortation with a warning. That's what the phrase is. Fathers, do not provoke your children. And it says, lest they become discouraged. The word to provoke means to stimulate. It's like poking the bear, right? You're enticing your children to frustration. How do we do that? We're going to talk about that. And then there's a warning, lest they become discouraged. So the fruit of this kind of poking the bear and provoking them is that they become discouraged. And the word for discouraged means disheartened, broken in spirit. They feel powerless. They don't feel heard. They feel enslaved. And they look back. And just as in the in prior decades, uh, a child might be mad because of an overly harsh father or parent, in this culture, they can do the look back and say, what were my parents doing? They took their hand off the wheel. They dropped the ball. They didn't prepare me for what life is throwing at me. Why not? And so we can provoke our children to anger in that way just as easily as we can being over the top. With our remaining time, 
I want to give some points. They're obviously not in the text, but they're, and they're not a comprehensive list by any means, I don't think, but I think they're very important ones. The ones that rose to the, list, the top of my list uh, of things that just personally maybe and also in life, but also from reading the word of God and ways in which we provoke our children to anger or can be provoking our children to anger and something we need, we need to be thinking about. The first one is in the context of a lack of understanding. If you're taking notes, and I got three points, a lack of understanding. A parent can provoke a child to anger by not understanding them, by not knowing them. I love this verse in Proverbs. Listen, Proverbs 25. The purpose purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. What's he saying there? The, 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 the heart is a mysterious thing. I don't even understand it, you know, it says in the Bible. Who can know it fully? It's a mysterious, it's a chasm, it's, it's hard to understand. But it says a man of understanding is going to try to draw it out. It's going to try to understand it. And one of our jobs then as fathers, as parents, is to understand our kids and to help them understand themselves in the context of what God has to say about a thing. Each child is designed differently with different struggles, different tendencies. We call them different bends. They all are shaped, you know this if you have children. Each one of your children is different in their own way. And so it's our job as parents to know what makes them tick, to try to understand them, to try to know them so that we can help them in these, in these struggles or these bends that they have to... Uh, to, to live or to think biblically or, or to honor God in the, the way they, they see themselves and see the world. Oftentimes children will say, I'm frustrated or mad or I'm mad at my parents because I don't think they really care about me. I don't think they really understand me. Now, a lot of times that's just a manipulative trick in my experience because they want to play more Xbox and it's, you know, or something. But a lot of times it's true especially in our world. We're so busy. We'll talk about that. John Newton said this. John Newton, you know the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. He, li- he grew up in a Christian home, but it was a miserable life for him, he says. And this is what he said about his Christian father. I know my father loved me, but he did not wish for me to know it. That's tough. That is tough. And let me give you an example I think that I think is very important in today's world. More and more with children and parents being misled by the new sexual ethic in our culture, we have to do a better job of knowing our children. Let's say this. Let's say your child exhibits behaviors that are not are in line with what we call traditional uh, behaviors or traditional roles of a boy or a woman or a girl. Maybe a a boy that has more feminine traits. It happens. They like shiny things. They like to dress up. They like to play with girls. Or a girl that's rough and tumble and has all of her friends be boys. The world says, well, they're probably trapped in in the the opposite. They're they're a boy, but they're really a girl. And so the world tells them that they need to plunge into that. But here's... A Christian parent might say, son, there's no mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. This is who you are. This is how you're designed. These are your interests. This is the way you are. And there's nothing wrong with that. There, there's, it doesn't make you not a man. It doesn't make you not a Christian. It doesn't make you something wrong with you in God's eyes. Now, you're going to have to work a little harder if you're a, 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 a young man who is more feminine. And maybe you take on a different job or a different role. And maybe you uh, are more creative. There's nothing wrong with that. Maybe you have a a job in the theater or the arts. That's fine. But you're going to have to work hard, son, at becoming a better leader and being more assertive and being a provider and a protector. That doesn't come as naturally to you. You'll have to work hard and trust God in these things. Same thing to our girls. We would say something similar. Just as if you had a boy... I have two young men and I have two young girls, but, you know, if they're all boy, that's great, glad, you know, that's who they are. That's how God designed them. They like to get in the dirt and wrestle. That's fine. 
that doesn't make them a man. And they're going to have to work just as hard, and I'm going to have to know their little band. I'm going to have to set them down and say, son, it's great that you like you are this way, but at the same time, you're going to have to learn to be more compassionate. You're going to have to learn to be more gentle. You're going to have to become a better listener. This is not just as important. You're going to have to fight. The point is we're trying to know them and we're trying to push them towards godliness and to what God says about a thing. And ultimately, we're trying to understand them in such a way that they can come to us and cast their cares and anxieties on him just as God tells us we can. Again, representing God, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. That's what we do with God, and we want our children to know that we care for them and they can come and talk to us about things and we can understand them. And we ask a lot of questions. We want to draw it out as the proverb says. They're not going to just give it to us. It's our job to know them and to sit down and to understand who they are and how God has made them. How do we, in, under this context of understanding, here's a few quick things. Number one, oftentimes we don't understand our kids well because we just don't give them the attention or we just neglect them. So busy with our work or our hobbies that we, our kids feel like second-class citizens. This is very true in America, very true. Just go play Xbox, I got stuff to do. Did you see what Sally did in class? Just a second, let me send these emails, and then, and then you forget. My, my kids bought me a Pac-Man game, one of those old school Pac-Man games, you seen them? They got like five or six, I liked Pac-Man back in the 80s, it was a thing. If you don't know what Pac-Man is, kids, go check it out. Here's the thing. I'm in my room studying for my sermon or studying the Bible, and I find myself playing that Pac-Man game, and then I'm listening out the side. Everybody's laughing out in the living room. Shut off the Pac-Man game and get out there. What am I doing playing Pac-Man when my kids are having a good time out in the other room? It's crazy. Get out of the garage. Get off of your hobby. Find out what your kids are interested in. I don't care if you're you know, girls like, or your kid, boys like theater or whatever, and you like to hunt, go, go to a play. It's good for you. Get involved in what they're getting on. Get to know them. Be involved. Be there. Don't be that parent that misses the games. Number two, favoritism. This is a way we, we don't understand our children where when we play favorites. This is a real problem. I've witnessed children who have deep, deep scars because it was pretty obvious that a parent favored another parent over the other. And they could never felt like they added up. They never felt like they could get to where the other kid was at. There were just little room, little hints, little nudges, little things along the way, instead of just embracing them for who they are. It's a joke at my house. Everybody says oh, that they're the favorite and stuff. And uh, it's kind of funny, but it's kind of not. And it's serious in the Bible. Joseph, if you remember, uh, Jacob's son, Jacob favored Joseph. And his brothers despised him for it. And they murdered him for it. This is serious business. Number three, discouragement or criticism. Oftentimes kids will be provoked to anger and they don't feel understood because they're never, there's nothing good enough. They might, you know, play in baseball, they might go three for four, which is a good percentage if you don't know that. Uh, uh, but you talk about the one time that they struck out. Always finding something wrong, never telling them that they did good, never praising them. I know that you can overdo it, of course. I, I was reading some things about Steve Martin. You remember the comedian? Uh, he, him and his dad were very distant, and his dad was very critical of him. One time, his father came to watch a movie premiere that he had. You know, he, he, did a, he was one of the best comedians of all time, right? And, and guess what his dad, they asked his dad, what did you think of your son? And this is what his dad said. Well, he's not as funny as Ch Charlie Chaplin. It's like, wow, really? And then that's why Martin says that the later in life, he, again, being provoked to anger, this is what he said about his dad when his dad died at the funeral. He says, the strange thing is, after he died, all these people came to me and said, your father was so much fun. And I thought, really? Who are they talking about? Wow, that's really Hard. Number two in the category, I got to move on, discipline. 
Uh, so the first one was understanding your children. The second one is discipline of the children. This is how we can provoke our kids to anger. Where uh, Discipline is the idea of instruction, correction. It can take many forms. Most of discipline is positive, by the way. When we think of discipline, we always think of spanking or you know, yelling or being mad at kids or whatever. That's not it. Most of it is positive. Good job. That's discipline. But parents are largely unsure about what it means to discipline their kids. Most of their thinking for discipline largely is taking from traditions of the way you grew up, which in many cases is not good, <laughs> or going with the social norms of the day. What everybody else's kids are doing, that's what we're going to do. Or a lot of it, even in that, is taken from secular or pop psychology. So rooted in behavior modification and propping up of the ego, and can't we conclude, <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. What has been dealt with us the last several decades, friends, it's just not working. And we see the fruit, even though the so-called experts tell us things like don't spank. I always wonder, and I've said this before, who are these experts? When they say the experts, I want details. Who are their kids? How many kids do they have? Because I don't think these people are living in reality. And I'm, I don't know. They don't tell you. It's just the experts. I'm, when you see that, just, I don't know about this. Just be very leery when the experts say. The experts have told us that it's not, it's not good to spank your children. They told us that everybody needs a trophy. <laughs> and uh, to put them at their children at the center of the world because we want to stroke their little egos. And friends, behavior modification is not the goal. Giving John, little Johnny a sucker if he behaves well in the store is not what the goal is, all right? Or counting to three for obedience. That's not the point. God didn't tell us to count. He doesn't count to three when he asks us to do something. He says, no, just obey. And that's what we're trying to teach our kids. What we need to understand is Proverbs twenty two fifteen. what the Bible says about little children. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Friends, what we need to understand again is that little kids, they have amazing propensity to do good and to be cute and, and just to say the kindest, sweetest things. They also have an amazing propensity to be evil, don't they? Sorry, that's true. And we all have examples of having to unteach our kids. Well, you never taught them to lie. We never taught them to hit their sister. That just comes out naturally. Why? Because the word of God tells us that we're born sinners, that we're selfish by nature. So discipline at its basic level is teaching the world, teaching them this world isn't about you. In fact, it's why I love the, the catechism, why we use it in our home. And I would encourage you, fathers, to use the catechism. The first question of the catechism, why did God make you, essentially? And the little two-year-old says, for his glory. Very, very, very important. It says right from the beginning that they learn the world isn't about me, essentially. What a great question. What a great way to start your children into thinking about the world. At the core of the problem, though, the Bible says we're selfish, we're sinners, and in that selfishness and sinfulness, we have an authority problem. Not a self-confidence problem. We have an authority problem. We don't like people telling us what to do. Proverbs 5.23 says, He dies for the lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he is led astray. The human heart does its own way. He doesn't want discipline. And when we lack discipline as parents, we're leading them down the path to death. Listen to what Ted Tripp says in Shepherding a Child's Heart. A great book, by the way, that's out there. I highly recommend it. The purpose of your authority in the lives of your children is not to hold them under your power, but to empower them to be self-controlled people living freely under the authority of God. This isn't about controlling. This is about giving them the ability to be self-controlled and to live for God. I'm convinced parents don't have their authority taken away from them. They give it away. That's a big statement. I'm convinced parents don't have their authority taken away from them. They give it away. In the area of authority and quickly, 
uh, or of discipline. Number one uh, way we can broke our children is a lack of di- discipline. Again, in generation past, in past parents were afraid or uh, kids were afraid. I mean, in a good way, they feared a parent's authority. And that's that's reversed. And now uh, children are running the show. Discipline, friends, is teaching them how to trust and obey authority. So important. And here's the thing about discipline, because it's hard, right? You, you, you feel like if I spank my kids, they're going to be mad at me. Or if I take something away too long, they're going to they're gonna have this thing against me. They'll get over it. And we're not talking about abusive spanking, by the way. Again, the culture likes to take spanking and use these instances of, of abuse. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about genetically designed by God, little areas to inflict. But the point is, it's supposed to hurt, right? That's the point of discipline. It's like it's supposed to hurt. A lot of we don't want them to hurt. That is the point of discipline. Listen to what Hebrews says about discipline. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. Do you love your kids? Discipline them, just like God loved us. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children, not sons. I don't discipline my neighbor's kids because they're not mine. Besides this, we have an earthly father who disciplined us, and we respected them. I not agree with them, but you respect them. Shall we not match more or more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, and it seemed best as it seemed best for them. But he disciplines us for good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful <laughs> rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It will yield its fruit. It's supposed to hurt a little bit. Number two, I got to move on. Overbearing, harsh discipline. Where discipline is all about uh, respect. Um, you don't get to ask any questions. Why? You don't ask me why. It's just because I said so. Is it wrong for a kid to ask why? Now I get it. Sometimes they keep asking why and they're just trying to, 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 to be a little, you know, I can't come up with a word off the top of my head without getting myself into trouble. <laughs> So, you know, you know what I'm talking about, but it's not wrong to say, no, here's why. And a lot of times here's in good discipline, because a lot of times we end up disciplining out of anger, right? And we just, we're in a rage and we spank or say things that we shouldn't, we shouldn't discipline like that. There's a strong warning. But here's the thing about discipline that's done right. First of all, we need to sell ourselves down if we are. We never should discipline out of anger. But discipline, good discipline, always is followed with something good. That's the model that we have from God. Our discipline hurts at first, but then something good comes from it. And so in our discipline, there should be something good that comes from it. There's a hug. There's forgiveness. There's a talking about what we did wrong. What could we, let's, let's run the scenario again. If you did it again, maybe you should do this. This would be a great way to honor God. So we talk about it, and what it does is discipline actually is a good thing, and it brings us together when it's followed by loving hugs, prayers, talking it through. Never just to discipline, to discipline. It's not all about respect. That is a big part of it. It's also about love and relationship. Number three, consistency. Uh, and, and quickly here, uh, we know what we're talking about being consistent. You know, when the kid says, yeah, just give it a day or two, they'll forget. They'll give you the phone back. Just, just let it go today. Tomorrow, you'll have it back because they'll forget all about it, right? That happens a lot as parents. We got to follow through on the things that we say we're going to do. Or when we discipline in an inconsistent way where one child makes a mistake and we spank them. And then the next day they make the same mistake and we let it go. And so they never know what they're going to get. <laughs> It's very confusing, and it causes them to, to be angry. You did it this way to this to your to my sister, and then you weren't fair to me in that way. You try to be consistent. They always find cracks in you, but uh, or making threats that you don't follow through on. You say you're grounded for two weeks, and then it's two days. Right? We got to follow through when we say it. We got to follow through. Uh, number three, uh, the, and the third category would be hypocrisy. And again. 
This is easy to figure out. When we say one thing and then we do another. Friends, the reality, it's the old adage, more is caught than taught. And it's very true. We demonstrate godliness. We demonstrate Bible reading. We demonstrate prayer. We demonstrate the love and, and a, 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 for the church and serving the church. We demonstrate character and telling the truth. Friends, they see this. This happens all the time, right? The egg in the face. We hear a sermon about gossip, and then they hear us on the phone gossiping about somebody. <laughs> we tell them not to lie, and then we, 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 we lie, and they, they know it. They, they pick up on it and say, Dad, that wasn't true. What you just told that person on the phone. Mm. Which why we have this very, very valuable tool given to us as parents called repentance. That is, we can admit that we're wrong and we turn around and go in the other direction. How important. If I could, I always say this, the, one, the, the most important thing we can teach our kids is how to repent, how to admit that they were wrong. So important. And we have to start with ourselves. How powerful it is to a child that when you come to them and say, you know what? What I did was wrong and I lied. And, and that won't happen again. And I want you to call me on it. You're important. I value you. Or you identify with your sin. That's important. When you, your, your child falls into some sin, you say, look it, I get it. I struggle with it too. But I'm not going to condone it. Let's fight. Let's fight together. Let's repent. Let's turn towards God. Number four, teaching. And again, we're going to come back to these verses and do a lot more on this. But it's our job to teach our children. It's not the government. It's not the church, church's job. It is our job to teach them how to see the world. And so family devotions, catechisms, teaching them. And if you don't know what you're doing, that's why I like the catechism. All you got to do is stay one day ahead of them, right? That's it. You get your catechism and you, you, you look at the, what's coming up the next day and you read it and you prepare through. And then you, all you got to do is stay one day ahead. You might not know a lot, but you can do that. And finally, overprotection. I have to close on this. This is a tough, especially in today's world. But what the craziest things are, there's a, we, we can't overprotect. We, we can't hold them in. They, they, they have to push the bird out of the nest. And when we do that, they have to be prepared for the life. If they never had the chance to face some of the battles that they're going to be facing when they're 18, we say this about college all the time, we purposely uh, allowed for some things in our children's life, knowing that they might fail, but knowing that I'd rather have them work through the failures now in the context of, of the home as they got older rather than when they're off on their own when there's no context for us to have influence over them. Now, that, that, every parent's going to do that differently. Every family is going to look a little differently. But friends, uh, more to come on this. But our goal is ultimately to lead them to the reality of the good father, to create in their lives the picture of a good God by modeling that and teaching that ourselves. How are you doing? Grandparents, parents, those of you who desire to have kids someday, we have to take the reins Let's start by, if you failed, some of us feel like, man, I've failed at this. I feel like that. Some, start by asking for forgiveness for your family and say, we're going in a different direction. If you need help, we want to help you to do that. Create new habits. They will bear the seeds of righteousness in your life and in your family's life for generations to come. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for fathers. I pray that we'd be convicted of just how important this stuff is. As we get into this series on the family, God, I pray that you would really have our hearts tuned in and uh, just to how important this way of seeing the world and knowing what God has said about the family and about our roles. So we trust you. We ask that you'd bless our day. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. And you're dismissed. Thank you for coming. Have a good Father's Day.